This is Join Us in France, episode 36. Hello, I'm Annie. And I'm Elise. And we welcome you to the Join Us in France travel podcast. Elise is a professional tour guide, art historian, and a really good storyteller. Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> On today's show, we're going back for thirds. Yeah, we are indeed. <laughs> is that really a good idea, Elise? <laughs> no, no, don't, 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 don't answer that. Don't answer that. Don't answer that. I don't know if in my life I've ever actually had thirds before. <laughs> I have to think about this. <laughs> On the menu today are macaroons and chocolates. Yes. And I also insist we talk about chocolatine because we're from Toulouse and we have to talk about that. <laughs> I don't want to eat them. <laughs> oh, I do. To find notes, photos, recipes for this episode, go to joinusinfrance.com forward slash 36. And now a little music to get us in the mood and we'll get right back to it. Okay, we're back with our sweet habit. <laughs> our sweet, our sweet habit. She's laughing. This is getting to be really bad. It's like, I feel like I'm bloating out like the, the, the Michelin blimp or something. You know? We had some wonderful feedback from listeners this week, including our very first voicemail. Our voicemail. Yes. With his wonderful <laughs> Scottish accent. No, no, I'll play it at the end of the show. Um, that was great. And... Two pear two, tart recipes. Two pear tart recipes. Now, who knew? From Tiffany, a listener named Tiffany, um, who knew that you could come to a website about France to get a vegan recipe? <laughs> would you have ever guessed that? <laughs> Not a French person would ever think about it, that's for sure. Yeah. Anyway, so that's the menu uh, for today. And at the end of the show... Uh, we'll get back to these wonderful feedback from the listeners. Also, I have to apologize because last week I made a mistake. When I was editing the podcast, I skipped a step. And so the sound volume for most of the show was really low. Ah. You had to crank it all the way up to hear it. So I apologize. I will try not to be, you know, forgetful ever again. <laughs> <gasps> ever again is a long time, Annie. Well, I'm getting to the age where I need a, like a checklist, <laughs> you, you know, a checklist. I, need a checklist. <laughs> okay. I don't have one really for the podcast. It's, I keep it all in my head and eh, I might need to do it some other way. Okay. Elise. All right. Okay. So <sighs> a subject, yum, yum, yum. The two of us. I'm looking at her face <laughs> with this sort of beatic <laughs> smile on it. It's like, I didn't bring anything to, to have us have a tasting while we're talking about this. No. I don't know if that was a good idea or not. It's, we'll, we'll survive. We'll, we'll just have we'll coffee. Survive. We'll have we'll coffee. Survive. We never have to worry about food and sweets and anything where we live anyway. So yeah, it doesn't right. really matter. That's okay. Right. So let's, we're going to begin with chocolate. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, Mm -hmm. Having, in the last about five years, done a lot of uh, chocolate tastings in a couple of the wonderful real chocolate makers' uh, places here in Toulouse, where we live. Right, right. And also now uh, in Paris. And of course, one of the things that makes these chocolate tastings very, very good, if you go to the right place, is that not only do they give you things to taste, but they really give you the history of chocolate. Uh -huh. So I've sort of incorporated that into my little brain. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I love it. And I don't know why, but the, you know, there are certain things like this that I just love the story of, you know. Uh -huh. And so uh -huh. uh, chocolate, some people probably know this already, but maybe not everyone does. Uh, chocolate is, of course, originally from... Mm, Africa? No, it's from Mesoamerica. It's Ooh. from Aztec and Mayan country. Okay, okay. I did know that. You did I know did, that, I, I know think. That. Yeah, yes, I think yes, you yes. knew that. Yeah. So uh, this is what happened, really. The uh, Spanish, of course, uh, went to find gold in, mm -hmm. in the 15th century, in the early 1400s. And uh, they didn't find gold. They found chocolate. We mm. could put it that way, among other things. But mm. the chocolate, the, the Aztecs and the Mayans, who were not exactly friends, you know, at that time, the Mayans were in the Yucatan Peninsula and what is now actually the south of Mexico. And the Aztecs 
They had their capital in Mexico City, and they were a very warrior people with a huge empire. And they would often even take people like the Mayan peoples and uh, the, the Guatemaltec and all these people as mm-hmm. slaves. Oh. But what's interesting is that in both their cultures, they used the cocoa tree okay, uh, and the beans from it, which in fact, uh, when you take a look at the beans after they've been taken out of the pod, they almost look like coffee beans. They're basically very yeah. similar. The bean itself, okay, not yeah. the pod. Uh, but they were considered to be a gift of the gods. Oh, well, and, they are uh, indeed. The Az- <laughs> yes, it is, I think, actually, a gift <laughs> of the gods. Uh, and in the Aztec and Mayan languages, which are not, exactly the same. And it's interesting to know that today there are still people who speak Mayan and it's apparently considered to be very close to the Mayan they spoke uh, 500, 600, and maybe more a uh, thousand years ago. Oh, cool. So they can really trace some of these things back. But anyway, the language is a language called Nahuatl. Uh, a lot of the languages in that part of the world have an atl in the end. You know, you have okay. sort of a guttle stop in your throat when you say it. And, um, the name in that language, which was very similar in both Aztec and, and Mayan, and I'm going to try and pronounce it, and I have no idea if this is exactly accurate, but we can write it down afterwards. It's chocolate, and it, it, it's with an X-O at the beginning. Okay. So you can hear why the Spanish, listening to this yeah, strange yeah. word, uh, came up with their version of it, which basically is chocolate, chocolate, yeah. chocolate. And uh, I don't know how the Spanish first spelled it, but uh, eventually either. it came back. Um, I'm not sure if there's a difference in spelling in, in Spanish and French for the chocolate. That's interesting. I, I never thought about you it. Know, I never I didn't studied look Spanish, so I don't really know. <clears throat> I don't know. know. We'll have to look it up. The, the word, I'll give you the spelling want, of if it. If I want chocolate in Spain, it, in Spain I just point. The you same. point. Uno. So, choco, choco, Uno. Chocolate. <laughs> chocolate. I say it the sort of the Italian way. I think there's no, probably even in Chinese they understand that, you know. So. Um, and what's really fascinating because of what they're now saying, what doctors here in France now say about eating some chocolate, it was associated with the goddess of fertility. Oh. And so the chocolate bean, which is in this huge pod, which grows on this very interesting sort of medium-sized tropical tree. It's a plant that actually now grows everywhere in the, on the planet around the equator. Mm. But it originally started there. Uh, the, the beans were used as money oh. because they were so valuable. And they were used as money and considered valuable because they were considered to have magical power. Oh, so there's something that has come down to us through the centuries about this, because there certainly is a certain euphoric quality to to the idea of eating good chocolate. Right. Those are the magical beans. Those are the magical (laughs) beans. Those were they've actually discovered in tombs that go back over a thousand years. Little, uh, uh, I guess, obviously fossilized cocoa beans oh wow and they are in a pouch and since the mayans had a very beautiful written language uh they can decipher some of what they wrote not all of it and they know that this was the equivalent of money Mm. and it's associated with a goddess and the goddess was a goddess of fertility so on the mayan drawings which are still in some of the the uh excavated sites that they have uh you can see People drinking this because it was a drink. It was not a, a thing you ate. It was actually a drink. And also, there's an indication of marriage ceremonies where they're given to the woman as a way of giving her a chance to be fertile and have lots of children. Oh. So it had lots and lots of uh, magical powers. And it was used by the rulers and the priest uh, class in magical ceremonies. Okay. Now, the chocolate that they used has nothing to do with the chocolate we eat. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Is uh, You know, it's very different. It's very different. Now, I don't know how many people know, but we'll, maybe we can put up on a podcast what a, uh, uh, what a pod haha, uh, of chocolate <laughs> looks like. It's a big, big thing. It's, it's about the size of a, a shrunken football. Uh, yes. It, it's about that size and about that shape. And inside it, you have this uh, gushy kind of white stuff that's called a mucilage. And inside the mucilage are the beans that are protected, actually, keeps them from being damaged by this white material, which is really organic. Um, And in fact, 
uh, thanks to the Spanish, we know all of this because even though they went over and basically destroyed all of these civilizations, they took notes of everything they did. It was oh, very nice. nice of them. Yes. You know? <laughs> nice. And, and document, document, uh, since this document. was a magical <laughs> drink that was supposed to give people special powers, yeah. they decided they should try it themselves, you know. And the original, apparently, apparently, the original way it was used was fermenting the the beans and this white mucilage kind of stuff and making this probably very nasty tasting kind of fermented alcoholic beverage mm. that the priests used in ceremonies and only was for the emperor and the court and things like that. And mm. then eventually, I don't know if this was right before the Spanish arrived or not, but eventually they started making this uh, drink that was mixed in with local spices, including uh, the, the wonderful... Uh, pepper pim pimenti type spices that we know associated with Mexican food. Mm -hmm. So it was a spicy, not sweet drink at all. Okay. And it was given in marriage ceremonies to the man and woman to drink together. It was kind of a unifying thing. And uh, when the Spanish arrived, they started drinking this, but they wrote down that it was disgusting. You wonder why they drank it if they thought it was so disgusting. I'm sure that they thought that maybe it would make them even more powerful than they were. They already had all this metallic armor and they bought horses and all these things that the poor Aztecs and Mayans had seen before. Um, That's funny. It's, real, it's funny, but... Uh, and then this is what happened. Apparently, it was the first monks who arrived because, of course, all of these ships that Christopher Columbus and all of the people that came even before him uh, and after him, they brought with them not only soldiers, but they brought with them uh, monks to set up monasteries to convert all these people. And the monks took this drink, which they, they knew was a special drink that was supposed to have special qualities and powers, and because it was so nasty and bitter and probably really, really vile to taste— they added honey to it. Oh. And it's still a drink. Uh, we're still talking about a liquid. That's a frothy liquid that apparently gets this kind of moussey type thing on the top of it. And they added vanilla bean because vanilla bean also comes from the same area. Yes. And they added some honey and they made it basically something drinkable. Huh? Oh. And that is what was taken back to Spain. You have to wonder why the monks wanted to try this fertility beverage at all oh i wasn't thinking about the fertility <laughs> part i was thinking maybe they thought it would grow them mu more muscles or something like yeah, that yeah, i don't the know magic bean i think uh, that it was a bit the magic, magic bean, bean. Yeah, i yeah. think it was more yeah. that i think <laughs> they were still thinking of peyote or whatever else they have in the you know I mean, i'm sure that for them it was just connecting to some of the special gods the aztecs and the mayans had and but for sure somehow. adding honey and vanilla to it definitely was makes a, a difference that was a good move that was a very good move <laughs> yes. it was an excellent move in fact <laughs> and so this is what happens apparently i was looking on several different uh, sites when i was making the notes because of most of the story of this i actually knew but i love these little anecdotes apparently there's a story who knows if it's true or not that the um They, they gave Columbus, when he came back from, he was going back to Spain from the very first trip, because he did make three back and forth, uh, a big bag filled with these cocoa beans to take back to the king and queen of Spain. And he thought they were, he thought they were goat poop, and he <laughs> threw them overboard. <laughs> so who knows? How can you know whether a story like that is true or not? It's just I thought it's a great little story. I it's demand like, to know who, who, who did this. Who did this? Shape. You know, who brought these things? What are you giving me as a gift? Right. Okay. So um, it, the story is that officially it was Hernan Cortes, someone we all know about in terms of the history of this, yeah. who in fact in the year 1528 uh, was the first person to bring back uh, the the actual drink to the king and queen of Spain. That is, prior to that, they had actually brought back some of these beans and they had tried to make the same potion uh, for the king and queen, uh, Isabel and Ferdinand. But it wasn't until uh, uh, Hernan Cortes actually brought it back and mixed it in with honey and spices and everything that the Spanish court decided that it was a drink that was meant for them. And it stayed mm. the drink of the Spanish court for a long time. Mm. And since at that point... Spain owned Flanders and Holland and parts of what would now be, I think, at the same time, southern Italy. Everywhere the Spanish Empire was, people in the court, that is the aristocrats and the nobles, because it was something snobbish to do, and not necessarily because they liked it, they started drinking this drink made from these strange beans that were brought back from 
uh, this new territory that they had mm, in, mm. The, in the new Spain, basically, of cool. course. And it stayed a drink of the elite. And even the priests in the Catholic Church in Spain started drinking it. But it was only for the elite. And it's very interesting because you wonder, how did we get to the point where you have now zillions of all of these inexpensive candy bars and everything else? It's, we've come a long way. Yeah. You know, there's like there's an ad for something. I can't remember what it used to be. We've come, we've come a long way, baby. Well, this is, <laughs> we've come a long way, baby, since the beginning of chocolate. And this is what happened. What happened was that in the middle of the 1500s, after Cortez had brought it back, the drink was given uh, to Charles V, who was, the, uh, in fact, the Holy Roman Emperor at that time and King of Spain. Mm. And when... Now, this is what makes this really so fascinating. And I, was, I went online and was looking at a lot of sites about this because it is true, and I have been in the city where this all started. This is still within the Spanish Empire. Nobody outside of Spain is drinking this strange drink. Nobody knows it exists. Mm. And then what happens? what city is that? Uh, It basically was in the court, which I believe, if I'm not mistaken, was at first in Toledo. I don't think it was Madrid at the time, but I'm not sure about that. Okay, okay. But what happened was that uh, starting, of course, with Ferdinand and Isabella in 1492, and then all through the 1500s, little by little, all of the Jews were expelled from Spain. And for reasons that are apparently very mysterious, but very interesting because all of this is verified in historical documents, Mm -hmm. uh, it was one of the things that the Jews were allowed to do was make chocolate, that is, make this drink. And they apparently were the people who were importing the cocoa beans. They had become involved in the trade of cocoa beans from the islands. So now apparently some research says that maybe it was because they were some of the people who went in the second or third wave to this new Spain, which is basically Mexico and and that area, Mm. and started doing this trading. But in fact, the knowledge of how to make cocoa and this everything you would do with the cocoa bean at the time, which is still liquid, was primarily the Jewish population. And as uh, I'm sure a lot of people know, the people like the Moors were expelled. They were given a choice to either convert to Catholicism which made them what are now called the Moranos, which were people who are what are called uh, fo- false Christians by uh, other people, but that was it. They were given a choice to either convert to now Catholicism. this is in Spain, right? This is in Spain, yes. Right, right, okay. Uh, or leave, go to North uh, Africa or go somewhere, but right. leave the kingdom. And uh, so, strangely enough, what so happened was... So both the Moors and the Jews were expelled. Were expelled, yes. They, were, they okay. were all expelled, or they were basically told to convert, and if they didn't convert and they stayed, they risked their lives. Okay. And this was the true for both groups anyway. Okay. Okay, okay. And a lot of these Jews uh, went from Spain to Portugal because for about 15, 20 years, they were welcomed in Portugal after being kicked out of Spain or choosing to leave Spain. And these were the people who knew how to make uh, this chocolate drink. And then what happened was, unfortunately for them, or fortunately for France in a strange <laughs> way, they were kicked out of Portugal. Again? And they were kicked out of Portugal, yes. And they were allowed to go to an area of southwestern France of what is now part of the Basque country around the city of Bayonne. Aha, uh-huh, which might explain why there's a very good chocolate museum. I and don't I'll, remember if it's in Bayonne or in it's Biarritz. In Bayonne. It's in Bayonne, and I'll tell you what the story of Bayonne is because that is what I know because I've actually guided there and I've been there for when they have this. It's actually fascinating. Mm, it's a nice They're, little museum. It's a wonderful museum yeah, and it's yeah. a wonderful little town, actually. Yeah, yeah. So now there was a count or a marquis. I honestly don't remember what title he had, but he ran the, the area. Basically, he was the lord that ran the area in th- this tip of southwestern what is now France, yeah. which had as Basque its main country. city at the time, the most important city was Bayonne. Mm-hmm. And he allowed all of these Jews in because he knew that it would be good business. Oh, I, okay. I mean, you know, let's let's be be clear about things like this. This was really and he was aware of the fact that they were in they were the people who carried this knowledge with them. Mm. And so they settled in a neighborhood of uh, Bayonne that still exists called Saint Esprit, which is, uh, <laughs> I've been to, uh, which of course that is... That means Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, That's right? funny. That's where the Jews go. And that's <laughs> where the Jews went. And that is where they set up their chocolate-making 
uh, little businesses where uh. they imported the cocoa bean, and that is how chocolate arrived in France. Oh. And then, this is what happens. In 1615, the king of France, Louis XIII, is married to a woman named Anne of Austria, but who is Spanish. Don't ask. We'll talk about that another day. That's fine. She is actually uh, one of the you know daughters of the king of Spain, but since they included in their territory Austria, she was given the title of Anne of Austria. Okay. And for the marriage... Sounds good. She brought with her uh, people who wanted chocolate. Ah. And they had their meeting to join up for the wedding, believe it or not, in the area around Bayonne. And so one of the things that was served at the wedding was this liquid chocolate drink that by now is with honey and uh, vanilla and maybe some other spices, but it's still a drink and it's still only for the kings and queens. I wonder if that, because at this museum in Bayonne, they actually give you a little bit of that old style chocolate really? to drink with the, with the spices in it yeah it's 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 not milky at all no it's um it's uh Is it frothy mm, i don't remember mm. but it was it was nothing like uh, a chocolate drink that no. you would have today but i mean it was you could drink it you could it, drink it it wasn't not horrible but it but was it, i mean i prefer chocolate milk today's <laughs> chocolate milk you know but I mean, I, my guess is that in a way, it, it, I, I would think that aside from people developing a taste for it, because I, I really suspect that there's something a little bit addictive in, in chocolate itself. But my guess is that it was almost like when people really want their fix of good, strong coffee now in the morning, because it was drunk in the morning and it was drunk in the middle of the afternoon. Mm-hmm. And they had separate special utensils for making the chocolate mm-hmm, liquid and mm-hmm. then pouring it into these cups. And uh, it, what's really interesting is that it really is thanks to the kings because so first we have Louis the Thirteenth and then his son Louis the Fourteenth later on is married to Mary Therese of Austria, another one, uh, who is also uh, someone who is addicted to drinking this drink, and they bring it to Versailles to the court of Versailles, oh, wow. and it is it literally a court drink, <laughs> okay, and they call it the Spanish drink. Ah. Oh. Nobody calls it whatever. I mean, I don't know what they had another it's name for it. It's drink. the Spanish drink. Yeah. And it stayed for a very long time, the drink of the kings and queens and the royalty. Mm. And guess who? Guess who starts democratizing the access to having this drink? It's the two countries where there is the biggest middle class, and that is England and Holland. Oh. And because you start, because these are countries really of merchants, right, who are doing trading all over the world and with their empires that they develop in the 1600s yeah. and everything else, what happens is eventually they start bringing back the cocoa bean and it becomes not something exclusive in the sense that you aren't even allowed to have it if you're not a member of the royalty, but it becomes something that if you can afford it, you can have it. And so in Holland and in England, it starts to be a what we would consider to be a democratized thing. It, we're still talking a drink. Okay. Yeah. Now, here we go. We skip a couple of centuries, basically. Good. And we're still talking <laughs> about drinks. Yeah. And people are starting to consider that this is... Now they have, uh, even in Paris, you know, the oldest cafe, the Procope, which is from the 1680s. It was a place where you went... How do you spell that? In the name of that P-R-O-C-O-P-E. Procope. Okay. La Procope. You went there to drink either coffee, which is a new discovery, or hot chocolate, basically. Mm. But we're still talking about a chocolate that is sweetened, but has no milk or anything like mm-hmm. that in it. Mm-hmm. And even Rabelais, the French writer, yes. wrote about it and said it was a wonderful thing to drink. Oh, so wow. people are starting to really talk yeah, about this a lot. Because he, he was known to be a Epicurean. Epicurean, you know? yeah, absolutely. So. He wrote books about food. He apparently yeah. I, probably looked like gargantuan or something. I have no idea what large he actually guy. looked like. Yes. He was a large guy. Yeah, And... Here we go. We're already in the 1700s. And believe it or not, this will take us back to the United States. This is just the different people who created different things afterwards. The first chocolate maker in the United States was in 1780. Mm. So we're already you know, in the 1700s. This, and it was a man time. named Baker. Oh, Mr. And Baker. And you have Baker's chocolate to this day. That's true. That's which true. is used mostly for pastries and baking, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing to know that these things go back that far. Yeah. The first person to try and make a solid chocolate was a Mr. Cadbury. Oh. 
<laughs> I've heard that name. In England. <laughs> yeah, okay. He st- how he did it, I don't really know, but he actually turned mm-hmm. it into a, something solid. So we're now starting to experiment with different things that you can do with it. And the first person to create really cocoa powder that you can uh, turn into a drink that we know today is a Mr. Van Houten in Holland. Oh, there you go. I've heard that name too. (laughs) And both of these, believe it or not, are basically 200 years ago in the beginning of the 1820s. Oh, that's cool. So it really was much later that we start having chocolate as as something you can put in your mouth and and bite on. Mm -mm. And all of those other years and for a couple of centuries, it was still a drink. And it was a drink Mm. that was considered to be for the ladies in the middle of the afternoon. It was very, very special. And they're just these gorgeous objects that you can see that they use for making them. And I saw a picture online. I didn't pull it out because I thought you'd, you'd be able to find it for me. In, in the 1700s and 1800s, men often had big mustaches mm. and they had these special cups for drinking chocolate that had a place where you could put your mustache so your mustache didn't get <laughs> covered with the froth <laughs> of the chocolate. I thought, I mean, just think of the industry that goes up around all yeah, of yeah, this, yeah, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, the first chocolate was made in Switzerland, mm. which makes sense when you think about it. Yeah. They're and still at it. They're still at it. And that was not until the 1870s. Wow. So it's a very recent That's really thing. That's recent. Yeah, it's very recent. And the very first uh, chocolate bar was made in France by a company that still exists that makes very high-end chocolate bars named Meunier. Oh, yeah, Les Chocolats Meunier. Les Chocolats Meunier. Oh, yeah. And mm. uh, they were the first ones to invent the bar where you have the line so you can break it off yes. into little squares. Thank you, whoever you miss the family <laughs> Meunier out there somewhere. I mean, just think of what you've done to our lives with all of this. I mean, <laughs> it's just formidable because just think of what we do if you had to break off a big block to just get your little square every yeah, day. Yeah, because you if, know? if you go to that museum in Bayonne, you will see that the chocolate, I mean, they show you how they produce beautiful little chocolates right. you know that have that have different flavors and right. different fillings and all of that they they show you all that production stuff but you see where they start from which is a big old block a block of 10 kilos that's right uh, of i don't know if, if it's, it, it's like a really basic it's, strong chocolate what it is is it's the it's what there are two things in it because i've actually watched them produce this what you have there when it's high end, which is of course the places in Bayonne are very much the, yeah. the high end, not these industrial. We're not talking about the little candy bars you buy in a supermarket. Yeah, yeah. What you have there is a paste. That it's, that's what they call it, pat. Uh, they, it's a paste yeah. of the the flesh of the roasted and fermented cocoa bean mixed in with cocoa butter. Ah, ah, ah. And it's yes. it's it's mixed together, and there's nothing else in it. There's so there's no sugar. There's no milk. There's none of the other things. Right. And then they add then they, the they, cream and right, the sugar. Exactly. And the... What they do is they take, uh, they weigh according to what recipe they mm-hmm. want to use. They basically reduce it with very careful temperature control to a thick, thick, thick liquid. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't even know if liquid's the right word, but a thick, viscous kind of, you know, they melt mm-hmm. it down. Mm-hmm. And then they add, according to what they want, they add a certain amount of sugar and they add, uh, so dark chocolate is purely that plus sugar and the amount of sugar for instance you have the 60 percent 70 75 now of course there are people who even will eat 80 85 i find that far too bitter i in, really don't like in it in french grocery stores you find 99 percent you find co- it's yes disgusting. it's disgusting it's great for making a in my opinion, wonderful I'm sorry. really really rich dark chocolate cake i don't use I don't use Baker's chocolate ever for making my chocolate cakes mm. because I find that if you take a 75 or 80% good dark chocolate bar, it's very good for making cake. It has just a teeny little bit of sugar, and I really find that much, much better personally for when you make a chocolate cake. Mm. But it's interesting because uh, a milk chocolate bar means that they've added, besides sugar, they've added usually powdered milk. Mm. And of course, now the big debate and the big problem for high-end chocolate makers, both in France, Switzerland, and and in Belgium, is that the European community is saying that uh, people uh, who make uh, chocolate things are allowed to use other than cocoa butter. Mm. And high-end chocolate 
only uses cocoa butter. It doesn't use any other form of fat. I Whereas see. if you go into the store and buy a Mars bar, and Mars, by the way, is actually from the end of the 19th century, mm. but any of those things that you buy that are chocolate bars that are not just pure high-end chocolate that say 70%, blah, 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 um, they all have things other than cocoa butter in them, and they're allowed to because now the European community has says you can Right, right. Well, and and it's probably better for controlling probably how you know shelf life and things like that. I'm not sure why they do that. I, it's probably a cost issue too. It's a cost issue more than anything yeah, else. It really yeah. is. Now, just a couple of other things that are really interesting to know. There are three kinds of cocoa beans, and uh, now even though they started in Mesoamerica, they are grown literally all around the planet along the equator. So you have a huge production in Madagascar. You have, of course, a huge production in Ivory Coast, which is where almost all of the chocolate that is used for uh, basic uh, candy bars is grown. It's not high-end chocolate in Ivory Coast at all. Mm -hmm. uh, Venezuela grows an enormous amount of chocolate, mm -hmm. uh, the cocoa bean tree. Madagascar now in Indonesia, uh, they have some as well. Uh, so there's a band that you can s follow basically around the equator all over the planet right. because the demand for chocolate is, is, is enormous. Yeah. It's enormous. Yeah. And you have everything from the the least expensive piece of real drugstore, you know, get three for 99 cents to chocolate that, of course, here in France or in a good place, even in Switzerland or Belgium, will be over 100 euros a kilo. And yeah. these are these tiny, wonderful little pieces that are made only with the high end. There are three kinds yeah. of chocolate. Criollo, which is the rarest kind, and it's the most expensive. Okay. The Trinidario, which I love the name of, hmm. which is actually a, 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 a hybrid tree between the Criollo, which apparently is the one that's having lots of problems. It's prone to disease. It's very ah. fragile. So they're really worried about whether it's going to last a long time. Okay. And uh, the basic one that is the one, for instance, that you see a lot of in uh, Cote Ivory Coast and places like that, which is called the Forestario. 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 Okay. And that is the one that is the most common, and that is the one that's used for your basic chocolate, whatever. So these are tree varieties. These are tree varieties. Okay, okay. Just like beans, like you have the Arabica, the Robusta, and things like that. Yeah, co for coffee. For coffee. And just like with coffee and just like with tea, uh, the taste of the beans depends on exactly where it is and the conditions of the weather that year. And they even give an AOC, like for wine, for mm. some of these places. So you have Ecuador, uh, Venezuela are considered to be very, very good right now. But these are not French AOCs. No. These are no. AOCs well, from the, those, the countries right. of origin. In other words, there's no, there's no cocoa bean grown in France. Right, right, right. right we right. just import all of that. Right. And we make, as far as I'm concerned, and that's me personally, I really <laughs> think, better than Belgium and Switzerland, I think France makes the best chocolate ever. Okay. I really do. I love, I've tasted in high-end chocolate places. Toulouse, we are really strangely very privileged because I think we have eight real chocolatiers where they make There's their own some chocolate. really good ones. And one of them dates from the 1700s. It's the Olivier Chocolate Place. Mm. Uh, mm. They are the oldest in Toulouse. And then, of course, you have some very, very wonderful high-end ones in Paris. But I find that French chocolate is infinitely better it's, than it's, the other i don't know that i would i can't really tell the difference honestly but i you find really really good chocolates in all three countries the chocolates that make me happy to pay you know 50 right. euros a kilo right or, or, or and more. here even in toulouse you know we have an outlet of what they call a chocolat de bayonne mm -hmm. which is chocolate from bayonne and there are still two houses uh chocolate houses in bayonne that have the names that are going back to the 1700s. These are two families that have continued to make wonderful high-end chocolate. And every year, of course, in Bayonne, um, in, the May, in May, there's a weekend that's a chocolate festival, and they show the factories open where they make everything, and you can see how it's made. And just one last thing, mm -hmm. because then we can go on talking about chocolate forever, and I certainly can. I <laughs> just want you to know... Now, chocolate is on the uh, stock exchange. It's a commodity, oh, wow. okay? It's like sugar and coffee, and it's a commodity. Uh, I don't know if this is today's or yesterday's or a few days ago. I just went online this morning, and uh, the, the price or the cour of the day, I don't even know how you actually say that anymore in English, uh, <laughs> the, the, the rate of exchange of the day is $3,311 for a metric cube of cocoa. Wow. This is the cocoa mass. Mm -hmm. Now, that's actually not a lot of money because 
can you imagine how much you can do with a metric cube of chocolate? I don't know. It's, a, it's big. <laughs> I would guess that you could probably multiply by 100 in terms of revenue, at mm, least mm, 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 mm. what you can get out of that. Because let's think, let's, let's face it, a little chocolate bar, we're not talking now about the high-end 100% no, yeah. chocolate. Take a, because it's the easiest one to remember, a Mars bar, you know. Yeah. Probably it has 10% chocolate in it or yeah, something. And yeah. it's the chocolate that comes from Forestario chocolate. So just the cheapest one. I, I'm quite honestly thinking maybe I should go out and buy some some. <laughs> What shares. Are you do with it? I don't know. Okay. I don't, oh, I'm maybe buy shares. some shares in, in some kind of <laughs> chocolate trading company. I don't know. The, and 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 chocolate, of course, is more and more popular now. There's even uh, chocolate makers in China. I mean, it it seems to be one of those things that makes people happy. And of course, as you yeah. and I both yeah. know, in France and maybe long live France, here doctors will tell women that if you want to feel good, have one or two squares of dark chocolate every single day. They tell women that? Yes. No, no doctor has ever told me that. Oh, yes. I, I And I know a lot of women who have said, I, you know. They look at me. They say she's already plump. She she's not already any more chocolate. any more chocolate. No, but why? Because chocolate has magnesium. It has potassium. It has something that apparently is like dopamine, which makes you feel good. It gives you a slightly euphoric feeling. Mm, good. So it's not just psychological. It's actually real, chemically real. Oh, that's real. good. That's good. So, and of course, they're saying dark chocolate. So of course you, I know you like. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a milk you're, chocolate. You're a milk person. chocolate person. Yeah. That has much less of all of that in it because it's not the real. Well, chocolate. I'm gonna have to be happy some other way. You're then. gonna have to be so happy, <laughs> but it makes me happy, and I know I can have my little bit. And of course, you have to learn to control yourself so you yeah. don't have too much every day. But chocolate is. There are chocolate makers everywhere, and of course, chocolate is used in pastry. And and one of your favorites is your wonderful. Uh, what was called here in Toulouse, uh, the chocolatine, chocolatine, <laughs> chocolatine, which of course is strange because why is it here a chocolatine and in Paris a pan au chocolat? Oh, who knows? Who knows? But it's it's delicious anywhere it's you delicious get it. Anywhere. It's pretty much the same. Um, uh, it's the same product. It's the same know, product, but... and of course, what that is is. It's, it's the dough that is used for a good croissant. And in the middle, they put two teeny little pieces of dark chocolate. Yes. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen one with milk chocolate. No, but it's melted into that flaky dough, so it's and fine. You it. And you I love it. it. And I you love, love it. I love it. I have a... Uh, okay, so I have a funny story. When I was in the U.S., I can't remember what city we were in. We walk into a French pastry, and I see these beautiful chocolatines, and I ask for... Uh, and I could tell the lady serving was French. So I, in French, I ask her, you know, de chocolatine, s'il vous plaît. And she lifts up her head like this, and she goes, you're from Toulouse. And I was like... <gasps> How do you know? <laughs> really? Yeah. You mean it's only in Toulouse that we say it, chocolatine? It's the Toulouse way. Everywhere else, they say pain au chocolat. Really? Uh, it must not be just Toulouse. I think it must I be just, it was a just a southern the south. thing. Yeah, it's a southern thing. Anyway. But... So she said Toulouse. Oh, though. she said Toulouse. She didn't she... say Marseille. She said Toulouse. Mm, she said Toulouse, and I might have my accent, my might have given me away too. It Who might knows? have given you away. <laughs> it might have given you so away. So my husband just passed me a little note that says, he wonders when CQ will start reimbursing chocolate. <gasps> oh, that's a great question, David. I actually, I think we should make a petition. How about we start a petition? CQ is the national health care in France. Uh I, you know, anything that's preventive in terms of health, I think that's a good idea, that's a right? Good idea. It's a good idea. Well, so, so everyone, you should know that uh, now we're talking, go get yourself a nice uh, chocolate bar that is at least 70% dark chocolate uh, uh, I, I and, say and take a couple of squares <laughs> and uh, you have those just, it depends. Some people find that eating chocolate at night keeps them up. It does not keep me up. No. At all. <laughs> really, at all. I have no problem with it. Uh, but it, they're good. it's good for you mm -hmm. and it's good mm -hmm. for you mentally and it gives you something that, you know, it, it's, those Aztecs knew what they were doing, you know? <laughs> They may have cut people's hearts out in the way of giving human sacrifices, but they loved their chocolate, chocolate yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, in, and oh it, yeah, uh, go, ahead, go, go ahead. ahead. No, I was just going to say before I forget, mm -hmm. mole. Uh, 
Yes, that the, yes. The, the, in, in Mexican cooking, of course, yes. mole, or mole, at least the mole poblano, uh, because there are other kinds of mole, and mole, of course, is a sauce uh, that, that is made. It has some chocolate in that it. It has chocolate in it, and it's the chocolate the way it was originally used. That is, it's the bitter, unsweetened uh, chocolate, but it has other uses, too. I love mole. Mm. <laughs> All right. Very good. Well, the other thing I wanted to add about chocolate before we move on to the macaroons is that in France, if you're in France, I would recommend that you just go to a grocery store and look at the selection of chocolates and buy a few plain old chocolate bars. Right. They will call, cost you between two euros and four euros, depending right. on the, you know, they're not super expensive because they're just a, a bar, you right. know. With nothing. Uh, Basically, the plain uh, chocolate. The chocolate. Yeah. And they are so good. They're so good. And it's also a really good thing to take back for gifts. Uh, when Absolutely. I When I go visit American family and friends, they really like it when I bring them French chocolate bars because they taste different they taste than different. the chocolate bars that you get in America. And they taste really good. And it's and not do. that expensive. No, it's not. And if you go to a good, big, uh, really good, big supermarket, uh, you have such a wide choice. Yeah. It really I mean, if amazing. you if you can afford to buy high-end, you know, beautifully crafted chocolates that will cost you 100 euros a kilo, then by all means, go ahead. Right. But if you, if you have more of a budget, the chocolate bars in France are really, really good. But, you know, talking about the high-end, the... the, the in general, the tendency is to make tiny, tiny, tiny little pieces. Mm -hmm. So you can actually spend maybe uh, 20 euros and buy a box that has a nice assortment of these tiny pieces because one of the ideas behind it, I was asking one of the these chocolate houses where I take people to do a tasting, and they said, this is, of course, a relatively recent thing, I guess maybe in the last 30 years or so. I'm not sure, but they've reduced the size of the little pieces. I see. So that people psychologically feel like they're not eating too much and you get a lot more of these little pieces right. per pound or kilo. Yeah. So you can actually get away with buying a small box that doesn't look that huge and it will still have uh, about 30 pieces or so. Yeah, in it. quite so a selection. They're, sometimes they're nice, you know, yeah. especially for people who really, really love uh, tasting exotic flavors and chocolates and things like that. Yeah, there's all know? sorts of things. And also the other thing that happens in France is that chocolate is seasonal. Yeah. So like Christmas chocolates do not appear in the grocery stores. They're not even made. They're made throughout, you know, like this time of year. It's right now. You know, it's late September. <laughs> They start making them now and they have to be sold and eaten by the end of the Christmas season. And there are lots of chocolates in France that you don't find in the summer. Uh, year round. That's Most right. of them you do not find year round. Um, my favorite, but it's because I'm a milk chocolate person, is one called Pyrenean. Oh, you like those. I um, love mm. those. You put them in the freezer. But mm. I don't like milk chocolate at all, so I just... But it's... It, but yeah, I like them. The, I, really I know like you them. love them. Yeah. I know. I have to remember to get you some every year at Christmas time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the, it, it is true, though. What you, um, I once went to one of the chocolate makers here in uh, Toulouse uh, trying to see if they also would allow people to come in and do a tasting and visit. And they told me that they shut down for the three summer months. They don't even make the chocolate in the heat of the summer, even right. though they're place where they make them is actually air conditioned but they're afraid chocolate is very susceptible to severe changes in temperature exactly and exactly. so they have to be very careful so it's uh it's like wines you know there's a there's, there's a, a time there's a time there's a harvest and the, there's all of that stuff it's fascinating because you think about it you know like yeah it's a piece of chocolate no 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 there's more <laughs> to it than that yeah. and i have to also say that one of my most favorite things and it's it's a guilty pleasure, but it's to have a crepe with Nutella in it. Oh. <laughs> I do not eat Nutella as a rule. Yes. But inside of a crepe, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. No, of course, since I'm absolutely not a Nutella person whatsoever. But uh, my question is, how much of that is really hazelnut? How much of it is chocolate? Do you have any idea? I don't know. I'd rather not look at the label. I mean, on when that you, thing. it's probably really, really bad for I you. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> but I, I Nutella is mixed. sold. I mean, when I was younger, when I first moved to America to go to college, yeah, we, I could not find Nutella anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so I used to put a few jars in, in my suitcase. in my suitcase to last me for you know 
the time I was there, the school year, um, and used it as bribe for, <laughs> for a few people. Oh, interesting concept. <laughs> yeah, yes. help me with my physics homework. I'll make oh, you some really? crepes and Nutella. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it works. Well, it's amazing. It does work. I mean, Nutella <laughs> is one of those things like other, like chocolate in general. I mean, you either are a Nutella person or you're not. Yeah, you but know. apparently America is totally turning into a Nutella place because really? you can find it everywhere and you can... I mean, it's it's everywhere. It's a really popular product. So there you have it. But I think there was some controversy recently. They had to pay some... They made some false claims. Uh, yes. I don't remember what it was. Well, but I know. I, I, that's why I was, I'm trying not to, to get involved in this because we want to go on to macaroons. But yeah. uh, even here on French television, there were lots of ads uh, saying that uh, this was a great thing to give your children for breakfast. It's not. It's yeah. over 50% fat and it's yeah. hydrogenated fat. And uh, it's really not good for you, yeah, yeah. unfortunately. But I must tell you, I know an awful lot of people who have tiny little skinny French kids yeah. who eat nothing at breakfast but a little slice of toast with some Nutella on it. Yeah, but that's because they it's, eat nothing else. Yeah, I mean, it's rather sad. I, I mean, they, there are kids who, ju- you know, I mean, we're not, this is not a... No, and I want to go on to macaroons. Yeah, but it, it happens a lot. I, you know, when I ha- whenever I have family over, I have to just say, "What do you have? What did you have for breakfast?" And half of the time, so it's Nutella. You know, the t- little two-year-old will eat nothing but Nutella on bread. There you have it. Oh yeah. Well, then we get into the controversy <laughs> of that breakfast. It's the yeah. end of civilization. End of civilization. We know exactly. <laughs> yeah. And everybody's going to turn into a Rabelais. You know, I was like. <laughs> Rabelais round. I don't know. Um, I even know where he used to live in Paris. It's in the Marais, but um, oh, there's wow. nothing on there that says I love chocolate. It's just a plaque <laughs> that says this is where Rabelais lived, you know. <laughs> All right, let's talk about macaroons. Macaroons. We, oh, we, we, are, we are in the country of everything that has to do with food is important, right? Yeah. And, of course, chocolate is something. Uh, there are f- a few people, I know a few, who are odd, they must have something genetically strange about them, that don't like chocolate. But that does happen. Um, yeah. The other thing that has become absolutely the rage, the rage uh, in the last, what, 10, 15 years, it yeah. really, I don't remember it being like that before, is macaroons. Yes. <clears throat> and of course, I know you can now get them also in nice fancy stores in the States. It's become a worldwide kind of thing. Yeah, there's apparently some really good macaroon makers yeah. in America now. There are. And, and if you yeah. go online... They do. They look the same, you know. I mean, it's like I don't know. To be quite honest, I don't know who is responsible in the in the last you know fifteen twenty years for turning this into this craze. But but well, the uh, thing is, they're so pretty. It's visually appealing. Yeah, but somebody started they, it's it. Colorful. Annie. Oh yeah, of course. Because what the, the 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 whole is. The, I mean, the thing is, you know, and and I know we talked about it even last week. It, it's something that actually goes back to the to the uh, uh, Middle Ages, and was actually introduced to France, and it lasted in a in its original form for a very long time. Mm-hmm. But the kind what we see now that you know, like you even posted on with all these many different colors and all. Yeah. Yeah. these experimental flavors it's apparently in the last 20 years right. so somebody some high-end company it may have been one of the ones we'll talk about la durée it could be i have no idea but one of these companies that is very chic started getting this you know idea which turned out to be an incredibly interesting idea of doing all of these different flavors and making all these beautiful colors and it caught on yeah so that now one of the things about them is the how gorgeous they are. Yes, they really they are really They're beautiful. gorgeous. I mean I don't remember ever eating a macaroon as a kid growing up in France. No. I'm almost fifty. We didn't used to, I never had one. No. You know, all of the other pastries that we've mentioned pretty much, you know. I've had them right. growing up, and but the macaroons, the cannelé also, because I think They're they used really to be Bordeaux. Bordeaux. Right. It used to be limited to Bordeaux. Yeah. Um but the mac, so I don't remember having them as a kid. But but what they say, okay. So but now they're everywhere. Now they're everywhere. Yeah. I mean, literally everywhere. It's like the equivalent to the cupcake craze that yeah. swept over America. But you it know, didn't last that years long. It, it seems like it's gone. Long. Yeah, right? yeah. macaroons. I think are here to stay for a while, at least yeah. in the form yeah. they're in. Yeah. Now, according to all of the things I looked up, uh, they were indeed brought to France by Catherine de Medici, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, she was, of course, a a, a very uh, educated and very cultured person, 
And the Italian court was far advanced in advance of the French court in the 1500s in mm. terms of what they ate and how they ate. You know, okay. it was the Italians that introduced the fork to France. Oh, uh, before well, thank that, you, Italians. <laughs> be, it was before that it was you picked things up with the point of your knife or you kind of grabbed it with your hand or you had a wooden spoon if it was something liquid. The mm. French really were not very up to date about certain things. And of mm, course, mm, mm. so she brought with her, uh, among other things, uh, a recipe for something called a, a macarone, which mm. is uh, sounds like macaroni, uh, the, the, the yeah. pasta, but apparently uh, is the Italian word for what it was at the beginning, which was a kind of meringue. Yeah, that's because that's really what it is. Yeah, it is what it is. With the apparently the difference being uh, that the uh, it's ground almonds, confectioner's sugar, whatever, however they made it in those days, and egg whites in equal amounts, mm-hmm. which is what makes it a little bit uh, grainy. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were small, and uh, they were they were basically not much bigger or pretty much the same size they are today, which means they were either what the size of. Uh, what 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 would you say that's like about an inch or so, or the little bigger ones that are about three inches wide or yep, something? Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, they're it, minis and they're, they're bigger. They're minis and they're bigger, but they're never huge, huge. You know, no. they're like a bigger cookie or something like that. Yeah. And it was for the court. I mean, yeah. all these things were brought in for the court. Well, you of know, course. I mean, yeah, this is yeah. she, her husband was Henry the Second. And this was a gift that she brought with her along with a huge dowry, apparently. Uh, Thank you. (laughs) And uh, she came, uh, and they say maybe it was originally from Syria, because Ah. in Syria there were zillions of almonds. Almonds were one of the things that made the basic pastries in Uh in Syria. And there was something that was made in the 1400s, and the people, uh, Italy, and of course she was from Florence, they were traders, and they traded with the people in the Middle East. And so Mm. maybe it was brought back from the Middle East. Cool. And then made into a kind of an Italian version. Mm. But basically, it was originally just one. So uh, we're talking now, of course, what we all know today is the little sandwich of of, of macaroon with a little filling. But uh, for centuries, up until really the end of the 19th century, it was just one. There was no filling, Mm -hmm. and it was basically your simple ground almonds, sugar, egg whites, um, maybe fleur d'oranger or something like that, and Rabelais, good old Rabelais, (laughs) who talks about chocolate. He talks about it as a wonderful little pastry. Uh, Uh So it was really something. So he knew about it. He knew about it. So obviously, people in Paris knew about it. But again, all of these wonderful things were originally for the royals, for the upper class. But what's fun about the macaroons is that there are about four or five regions of France that proclaim to be the original (laughs) people who made macaroons. Ah, And they are. And they are. And of course, obviously, what that means (laughs) is that each one created a slightly different version. Yeah. Because we know for sure that Catherine de' Medici was the first one to bring it to the court. Okay. So which regions are those? So one of them is the Ardèche. Okay. Oh, now we have to explain where the Ardèche is. Well, it's in the middle of nowhere. It's in the middle of it's the, the south, middle of France. South, uh, south center part of France. It's actually a beautiful, beautiful area. Gorgeous for hiking and, and everything. Yeah, it doesn't have a lot of big cities. <laughs> it doesn't or have a lot of big cities. Yeah, it's and apparently rural. Uh, there's a town there called Joyeuse. Joyeuse. Uh, oh, sounds that's, wonderful. That's a great name. Isn't that cute? And uh, happy. the story is that in 1581, Catherine de Medici was invited to the marriage of the Duc de Joyeuse. Oh, that, that would pay for that name. Isn't that nice? Monsieur le Duc de Joyeuse. Monsieur le Duc de Joyeuse. <laughs> and she brought him some macaroons as one of the gifts for the wedding. Sounds and they good. have been making them in this town ever since. Because they keep well. They're, you know, they travel well. They travel very well. Yeah, I mean, if you don't bang them up, I mean, you can The you cream can doesn't travel well. That's the problem. Well, it depends on the, the kind of filling they put in there. And then apparently two other places that contest to the being the place where it all started. Mm-hmm. One of them were going back to Basque country, interestingly enough, because mm. of all these weddings that happened between Spain and France and all this stuff. So right. we have in 1660... Um, a man named Mr. Adam, like an Adam, mm-hmm. uh, who uh, gave uh, Louis the Fourteenth. Here we go again. He had chocolate. He got macaroons. He got all these things for Very his nice. wedding in uh, uh, Saint Jean de Luz, which is where he met his future wife. Mm. Um, he gave him um, macaroons, and the Adam House of Macaroons still exists in Saint Jean de Luz. Oh, nice! From the 1660s on, mm. have to, we have to go there and taste them. I think. Yeah. <laughs> And then, of course, there's good old Versailles because Louis, of course, Louis XIV That's went back lived. up to his nice little house in Versailles. And uh, there was a pastry maker who was an official royal pastry maker named Daloyo. 
I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. How do you spell it? D a l l o y a u, dal I can't figure out how to do the o y a u. D a l l o y a u, dal dal and Mr. Dal Sorry, I had to. I had to write it out. Yeah, I, I, it's one I've always had a hard time with. <laughs> he gave. Um, He gave the macaroons that he made to the king and he became the official macaroon maker and stayed his family and uh, stayed the official macaroon maker through to Louis the 16th, who unfortunately lost his head, not because of the macaroons, but because of other mm -hmm, things. Mm -hmm. And guess what? If you go to Paris, you can still buy macaroons from them. That were you. Yes, indeed. Oh, how nice. It is one of the they and the Adam a uh, house of macaroons are apparently two of the oldest still in existence. Okay. And it's amazing. And it's, so, so Dalwayo is in Paris? It's in Paris. And Adam is in... In, in Basque country, in Saint-Jean-de-Luz. Saint-Jean-de-Luz, okay. And now there are others that put claim to their versions of it too. Uh, one of them is Reims, which we know from Champagne history. Mm. And another is Amiens, which is northwest of Paris. Well, in Reims, they have these little pink cookies. Those are the ones I talked about last champagne. week. Yes. That they're not macaroons. No, no. And so I don't, you know, yeah, they no. claim, claim to both. Well, let's give them the pink ones and not, not the macaroons. I <laughs> we mean, decide. We just decided. We'll just, settle the issue. We'll settle the issue. <laughs> the Reims has already enough they good They already stuff. have enough good they stuff. They don't need that. They don't need the macaroons. <laughs> and then uh, uh, you get uh, uh, the house that still exists that has one of, to this day, one of the best macaroons that is all over Paris and has some branches elsewhere, and that is the house of La Dure. Mm. which was started in the 1860s and they are the ones who invented the macaroon sandwich with the cream filling ah so how do you spell their name l-a-d-u-r-a-e -E -E -E. and La I have tasted theirs and you have branches of their stores all over uh, okay. Paris and in some other chic towns uh, you will find them and uh, they are absolutely delicious and interestingly enough so it wasn't until the 1860s that they obviously you have to create something new to sell more I mean obviously this sure, is one of the, innovation they created good. the idea of the tiny little two-part macaroon with the yeah. cream filling but they were still basic flavors is it a cream filling or is it like a jam or no it's a cream filling huh it's a cream filling and it has uh it has cream And it has a little bit of butter and egg white and s then the flavoring of whatever it is. So there is no jam in these. These are mm, all. Mm, mm. Uh, and now, of course, you have. And then you get uh, another uh, family of Hermès, like Hermès for the bags, except yeah. it's not the same family as far as I know. I don't think so. And there's a man named Pierre Hermès who makes us what are considered to be today some of the most luxurious and innovative macaroons. And his main store is in the uh, 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 6th arrondissement of Paris. Mm. And uh, when you go in, it's going into macaroon heaven with these colors. <laughs> it looks like it, it's like walking into a stained glass well, uh, building with right. all of the beautiful that's, things. That's you know? one of the reasons why macaroons, I'm sure, ha are doing so well, is that they're visually appealing. Right. Even, even for somebody like me who does not care for crushed almonds, uh -huh. I will eat a, a couple of macaroons. For one, for, for one thing, they're small. So they're it makes, small. You know, it makes you, you know, not feel like you're being a pig. Right. They're colorful. They're beautiful. They Tastes pretty good, you know. It tastes pretty good. I mean, good. It's, it's not my very favorite food in the universe, but it's it's good. It's for something that has almonds in it. It's fantastic and interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I happen to, I would love to be able to taste them without the cream filling, since I'm not very big on cream fillings. Mm -hmm. Even though I know that now, of course, one of well, the you things you can that, make the, make your own. Have you tried to ever make? No, them? no, I haven't. I've made meringues, but this is really. I, I find them very delicate. There's a the. Pe the best macaroon, and that's where Pierre Mess is apparently considered to be one of the very best. Um, they're they're very delicate because they're slightly uh, crunchy outside. These right. are tiny little things. They're very soft and delicate inside, and then you have this cream filling. And apparently, he's responsible in the for the idea of not just uh, matching up the outside and the inside. You have cafe, uh, cassis, uh, uh, chocolate, vanilla. Lemon. But he started doing, and this pistachio. is the very guy. My favorite is, is pistachio. Is your pistachio. Yeah. He makes cream fillings that are not the same 
flavor as the macaroon part. Ah, uh, yes, I've seen See? some like that where right. where it's, it's a combination. Yeah, they're they're multicolored. Right, and so uh, and of course uh, these are really up high end. Uh, these are yeah. these are very expensive. You'll probably f- spend five euros for five euros for, a small for one. it's five euro. I don't know if you five euros, but for instance, you can. It's usually sold by the hundred grams. So if you get the little ones, I think you can get maybe five and I would say five and a hundred grams. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe four. And that's, I've seen them for about six, seven or eight euros for a hundred grams. So, okay. But, okay. but they're teeny, as you say, you know, uh, the big yeah. ones sell for three or four euros per one. Yeah. Uh, La Dorée has uh, wonderful uh, shops because they are tea shops as well. So you can go in and get a nice tea or coffee and get a uh, uh, one or a whole if box they ex- of them. Export those. Oh, I think th- they they certainly ship all over France. But the story is, um, um, which is basically a little contradictory to what you were saying, the fine macaroon houses, which are often, interestingly enough, also places that make their own chocolates. For some reason, there's a combination there. But they will tell you that they do not last a long time because the, uh, the not a long time. They but will, like, three four weeks is the longest yeah. you can keep. Well, that's them. a long time for for a dessert. For a dessert, yeah. right? But uh, apparently, the 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 freshness of the macaroon really disappears after about ten days or something like that. Yeah, you, you want to eat them fresh, but fresh. I mean, most French pastries you usually, usually do. It's right. two days, right. you know, well, three days maybe. So by comparison, the macaroon right. keeps longer. And they are, uh, and as you say, I mean, we have now uh, uh, several places here in Toulouse and there's a, a bakery that uh, just opened up a second branch that is one of the ones that's famous here in Toulouse for making them. And and I was just standing in front of the window the other day and it's just gorgeous. Yeah. I mean, you have almost every color under the sun. Yeah. Uh, they're just, I, I don't know if they're, as good to taste almost as they are to look at. They're just so beautiful. <laughs> but you 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 have such inventiveness in the flavors and everything. And they are really, uh, for people who love things like that, they are a great gift. And they are also a good choice for most people who have celiac disease because they, they there's no flour in them. Now, if they're... Well, that's true. Yeah, yeah, if they're made in a place... That also makes other right. pastries. You Maybe there's some contam- contamination. But I, I had a, a friend who had, I mean, not just gluten intolerance, but full-on celiac disease. And she could eat macaroons. She could eat macaroons. That was the only dessert. So if she came over uh, for lunch, that's what we had. Oh, that's interesting macaroons. to know. Yeah. yeah, so it's it's a, it's a, an added advantage uh, because... It seems like this uh, gluten intolerance is growing right. all over <clears throat> the world, right. um, and so so macaroons are a, a good an- answer to. <laughs> if you good, want something sweet, yes. but no gluten, but no gluten, yeah. yeah. And, and basically, uh, and chocolates a, would be the same. And chocolates would be the <clears throat> same. And of course, uh, they are like, uh, you know, the, there are kinds of macaroons that are also made in France that are called rocher, which are made with uh, um, coconut and, mm-hmm, and egg mm-hmm. white and sugar. Uh, so you know there are other kinds of meringues as well, but this one, of course, is the what one. What they that called is, in English? It's like a c- Congolese. Uh, Congo. Uh, I thought Cong- is Congolese the American? No, I think that's the French that call it oh, a Congolese. Congolese. I don't know what they. I think they called coconut macaroons. I'm not sure anymore. There's a name. There's a name. It's not coming back. But to me. Uh, but but again, all of these are things that are made with uh, egg white, sugar, and basically starting with ground nuts. Mm-hmm. So of mm-hmm. course, that's not good for people who have nut allergies. No. You know? <laughs> uh, I took Pick people. Pick your poison. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> the, the, the wonderful chocolate place that I take people to for a tasting in Paris that also makes their own macaroons. Um, one of the women on one of the last tours, uh, she was tasting some of the chocolate, which did not have nuts in it. And then Somebody said, well, could we taste a couple of the macaroons? And she said, well, let I bow out. You know, I mean, yeah, obviously yeah. you can't do that if you have any nut allergies. Yeah. yeah. But but uh, otherwise, these are, uh, these wonderful, are wonderful things. Yeah. yeah. Mm. We're very lucky that we have that many wonderful desserts. Desserts. Food-wise, France is a paradise. I have to, it's, It is a know. paradise. And, of course, one of the things that makes it beautiful is the way things are presented yeah, and also because French people emphasize quality and the craftsmanship of making the very best texture, right. flavor. It's not quantity, right. you know. In America, you have good food too, but they, 
for the longest time in America, they they just tried to impress you with how much how they much? gave you, right? Which is ridiculous, in my opinion. Rather, but it, but in France, it's always stayed. You know, the portions are small. The but it has to be top notch. But it has to be top notch. And they like to be able to charge. I mean, I know people who are bakers, and they they. They would rather charge a little more for a higher end product right. than making, you know, run of the mill, make them cheap, sell them cheap kind of products. Right. Um, so that makes France expensive too, I guess. That's, I guess it does, but it's the other side of the coin. But it is uh, all but the we things have some are great so things. wonderful. That's, that, yeah. It's okay, very good. so <laughs> here we go. All right. I have not put on a pound just talking about it. No, <laughs> I'm just thinking about my chocolate. You know. <laughs> I I don't keep chocolate in this house because if I buy it, I eat it. Oh. And so occasionally I will buy a nice chocolate bar. One of my favorite ever is like the Cote d'Or. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a, it's a very, I like them. It's a, it's a grocery brand. I mean, it's, but it's, it's like it's a good large distribution brand. kind uh, French, of, yeah, uh, French. Um, and they make one with whole hazelnuts. Ah, Oh. But you like the milk chocolate anyway, so, right? But they yeah. they make it milk chocolate or dark chocolate, right? But their their version of dark chocolate is probably seventy percent, which it's, is wonderful. Yeah, it's it's, 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 it's not, not too bad. It's it's just it's not more than that. It's it's think. a very. In fact, what is interesting to know is that uh, if you ask the people in the high end chocolate places, they will tell you that the ideal percentage is in fact seventy percent. Mm -hmm. They make things with more on demand because now there are a lot of people who think it's less caloric if you get more, but basically they consider that even if you're making tiny pieces that you put some kind of filler in with a fruit or spices or mm -hmm. nuts or whatever, it doesn't matter, uh, that it is the ideal percentage is 70% mm -hmm. because you get the maximum flavor out of the chocolate and it doesn't overpower by its bitterness mm -hmm. or anything like that. And if you're gonna if you're gonna get chocolate with something else in it, what's your favorite? What? Well, I what's the flavor you that's like? That's a hard one to me because I actually I guess it's very hard. It, it sort of depends on my <laughs> mood. But yeah. I love I happen to like the combination of chocolate with uh, a. a coffee cream little filling mm. inside i love mm, the mm. combination of the dark chocolate yeah. with a little bit of some kind of a very coffee filling. A coffee filling but one of the others that i've discovered recently that is wonderful and it's made by this uh, place where i go in paris which is very interesting is a little bit of an orange like an orange rind just tiny infinitesimal right. pieces inside that's with one it. of the flavors i love i, love. I, I, I like love that. chocolate with orange with orange or chocolate with hazelnut and I'm not a hazelnut person. That's interesting. Mm, or I really like chocolate with mint. As with well. mint, I I've, I tried it with pepper, and I tried it with um, uh, even jalapeno. You yeah. know, spicy stuff, and uh, it's okay, but it's not my favorite. I, I I find that the mint. The problem for me is that I find the mint is too uh, overpowering oh, in general. It can be pretty strong. Whereas yeah. uh, uh, the, the, now the new rage with little tiny pieces of chocolate is to try things like different herbs. I've tasted yeah. them with things like that. I had one recently with, with pieces rose. of ginger that yeah, was delicious with ginger, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah but I'm not a nice. ginger person. So oh, much. see, but in my but in my household, if I buy chocolate with ginger, it'll be gone it'll in gone. two seconds. But again, ginger is a little bit like mint. It's almost too much, you know. It really is yeah, such a very yeah, strong, strong taste. Strong. But but uh, maybe for me, ultimately, I just like pure chocolate. <laughs> That's and it. it. And if I have a box of macaroons, I will go for the pistachio every time i mean the coffee ones and i guess i'm, like I'm an obsessional person about coffee <laughs> coffee ice cream coffee macarons but yeah but chocolate i would settle for a piece of pure criollo 70 percent anytime yeah yeah anytime it just make me smile <laughs> okay excellent okay let's go back to our voicemail okay from colin yes he's Okay, I have he's to play lovely. it. He's really, it's very sweet. Thank you, Colin. And then I exchanged a few emails with him and uh, thanked him for being the first person to leave us a voicemail. Because, you know, I'm, I, I put that on when I first started the website. And I think I only mentioned it in one episode that you could send us a voicemail. Right. And nobody ever took us up on it. And I just, you know, it wasn't that important. But it's really fun to be it's able to fun. play it. Yeah. And so Colin said that he, he tried it uh, because he, he needs practice with the computer. Ah. And so everybody else, if you need practice with the computer. S tell us something. Send us an, a voicemail. We'll play it on the show. It was lovely. It's in fun. fact, it, it, it didn't 
dawn on me I couldn't figure out what his accent was until the very end, you see. Was, <laughs> he said he, it's he yeah. when he told us. I thought, hmm, that's an interesting accent. I wonder where he's from, you know. <laughs> okay, let's listen to Colin. Yes, uh, <laughs> I, I have been looking at all your pastries and they all look delicious. Uh, I wouldn't know where to start. Some of them I haven't tried before. Uh, macaroons I like. Madeleines on the tartan, but you have given me the inspiration to try more. Okay, good girls, I thoroughly enjoy your show, listen to most of them, and I really must get to France, Paris, because uh, it's a place I haven't seen. You make it sound very interesting. And I can hope you understand my bad diction and the Scottish accent. Keep up the good work, girls. Bye bye for now. Oh, au revoir. Okay, wasn't that nice? Oh, it was fun. It's great, huh? Thank you, Colin. We'll, um, we, we hope to be able to play other voicemails from other people. Thank you. And thank <laughs> you for the recipes, Tiffany. Yes, and so I now I have to mention the, the recipe. T Tiffany... Um, so the pear tart is a very classic French because you, most French people make it either with fresh tart that they have in the garden or with canned tart or canned pears, pears. or whatever. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very typical kind of scratch, made from scratch kind of cake that French women make. Men, I guess, too, sometimes. Um, and uh, so she had this recipe in her family from an aunt and uncle who lived in France for a while, I think. And she liked it. Uh, and she, she sent it to me and then I wrote back and I said, well, what, do you have a picture of it? And she said, oh, I, I probably don't because I, I eat vegan these days. I'm like, oh, well, yeah, that would be a hard recipe to make vegan. And she took it as a challenge and she made it and she, made it, and she sent us instructions on how to do that and a picture and her vegan tart looks it's beautiful. scrumptious. <clears throat> It's fantastic. So congratulations, Tiffany. You are definitely a very, very good baker. <laughs> and if you want to see that, you go to joinusinfrance.com forward slash recipes. And you have to scroll down a little bit because it's just on one big page. I'm putting a whole bunch of different recipes that are appealing. And that. Uh, and if you have a favorite French recipe, by all means, share. We, we enjoy hearing from you. Okay, that's okay. it. That's all I have to say. I'm out of breath. I'm thinking about my tart Normand again. Mm. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Tu es une grande gourmande. I am indeed. Yes, gourmand. <laughs> okay, listeners, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, everyone. Please share the show if you enjoy it, because like I like to say, you're our only advertising budget. <laughs> so if you don't share it, nobody's going to hear about it. Thank you very much. We'll talk to you next week. Next week. Au revoir. Au revoir.